Hello, everyone. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series, Settle Back. We have an amazing show today. I've been waiting for this show for a number of weeks. I've been able to invite a real entrepreneur. I call him an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. His company, his brand is so well known. You probably have, or if, or if you know someone that has a purse, you probably have one of his company's purses in the closet. His name is Mr. Tony Drockton, and he is the founder of Hammett. He's also called the chief cheerleader, which I love so much. And when it comes to premium brands, when it comes to a premium American brand, Hammett is a leader. I'm so honored to have Tony on the show today. Tony, welcome to the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Thank you, Andy. That was one awesome introduction. Just keep going. Why don't you just keep talking about me for the next half an hour? I'm good. I love it, Tony. I love it so much. You look so great. You've got such a great brand. Everybody knows about it. But before we get into it, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet and tell us about Hammett. And we're a luxury handbag brand right here in Hermosa Beach, California, born and bred. Uh, we founded 13 years ago. It seems like a long time, but we really just got our wheels uh, beneath us around three and a half years ago, Andy. And that's when I brought on our current CEO, Andrew Forbes, and I'll talk more about that later. And uh, when you think about the luxury brands, most people just think of the great European brands, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Prada. They don't really put the American brands in that category anymore. You know, the Coach, the Kate Spade, the Michael Kors. So when we launched, we decided we were going to fill the white space above the American brands, but below price point of the European brands. But we wanted to offer that same experience and absolutely the same high quality materials and workmanship with great European brands. And we pulled it off. That's why we're the fastest growing American handbag brand right now. That's so powerful. It's so amazing. You know, when you're thinking about your brand, and of course, everybody that watches the show, you know, we're big about brands. We talk about it all the time, how important it is to build the brand and make sure that the people buying your product or your service, that your brand resonates with them. When someone buys a Hammett bag, what do you want going on through their mind during the purchase and after they purchase it? What do you want them saying to themselves about Hammett? You know, when someone encounters our brand for the first time, I want them to have that aha moment. Like, how come I don't know this brand? That's the first step. Because what that means is we've done the work. And most of the time, people are going to encounter a brand for the first time right now on that mobile phone, on that little device that we all have in our hand. So we want to make sure that we're positioned properly. So when they encounter us, our ratings and reviews are in place our imagery and our storytelling is already there. And hopefully we're already referral anyways from somebody, maybe a friend, a work associate. So when they go into that phone to check us out, they have the aha moment. And then when they experience our brand for the first time, when they, when they touch the leather, they feel it's the softest leather in the industry. When they put it to the test on functionality, they're going to find that it has zippers all in the right places. It's got exterior cell phone pockets. It's got adjustable straps. It's really, the zippers are smooth, so smooth, you can open them with one hand. So it's going to pass the sniff test of what they want in a luxury handbag, but it's going to have the additional functionality that they're not getting in those brands. And then lastly, the experience with the brand, with the product, with the people that represent it, it has to be first class and it has to be memorable. And for that, we have a lot of fun. Our, we have two of our own retail stores in California. A person walks in, it's old school. They get a glass of champagne. They offer a bottle of water. They're cold. We laugh. We have a good time. We might not even talk about the handbags for a few minutes. We get to know each other. And next thing you know, they fall in love with the associates or if they're meeting me myself, then they fall in love with the product and then they take it home. And then the third part of that experience is where I think a lot of, a lot of companies fail. It's the after initial purchase. And that's where you really want to excel. So we made a decision early on, lifetime, no question asked, warranty, no receipt, no registration. And what that means is just yesterday in our Manhattan Beach store, a woman came in with two original, actually three original Hammets that were over 17 years old because Stephanie Hammond was making them in her home for years before I invested and we partnered 13 and a half years ago. And 
she's like, what can I do with this? And our team's like, give them to me. They're going to go to our Hammett Surgery Center and they're going to come back looking amazing. Of course, there's no charge. We're going to put new zippers on it, new linings. We're going to bring them back to life and they're going to, they're going to look great. Yeah, that's amazing. Of course, those are collector items right now. So that's awesome. Now, yeah. one thing you've done a great job of is so many people love it. And when you go to your social and you look at, you know, everything that's going on, you have so many celebrities carrying your, you know, your fine quality leathers. You have so many people of importance carrying them and they, they're carrying them because they just love it and they love the craftsmanship. So when we think about the craftsmanship of what you're able to put out there, that's one of the things you become known for. Why did that become sort of the leading edge for your company, craftsmanship. I mean, when I think about Hammett, I think about craftsmanship. Thank you, thank you. I mean, it was a differentiator. I mean, we solved a problem in the market and that problem has only gotten worse, uh, especially in the accessories, more specifically in the handbag and in the America. In the end, it's been a fight for lowest cost and a fight for the biggest discounting in our industry. So it was pretty easy to say, we'll focus on that original to me that old school coach, we're going to focus on the highest quality craftsmanship. And we think people will come and they'll be willing to pay full price for it. So the fact that we're able to sell at full margin, full price also allows us to keep going deeper into better and better uh, design, quality and craftsmanship every year. So we've improved upon it every year. Yeah, I love it. And so many people have heard about what you've done now they're able, of course, to walk into the stores, but they go to the website. Now, this is very interesting, and I love this so much because we tested it. When someone goes to your website, I mean, you know, you take care of the shipping. I mean, if there's a return, I mean, you take care of that. I mean, for everything you do is what I call the primo VIP treatment, and it's remarkable. Where did that sort of idea come from, that thought about treating your clients with such kit gloves and this white glove treatment you're able to give? You know, I go back to a story and Andy, you triggered it. I forgot about it. When I first started the company, my biggest uh, order was Bloomingdale's. And we did a trunk show in four doors. And next thing you know, we did so well, we were in eight doors. We shipped out a brand new collection with these new zipper pulls on it. They were different than these right here. And I hadn't pressure tested the zipper pulls, but they were beautiful. All of a sudden, they started snapping, snapping. And we started getting calls from the associates like, hey, someone brought one back, it broke another one. And then some customers would call. And I bought a hammock, they broke. We made a snap decision right there that we were going to arrange for the bags to go directly to the closest shoe repair to any customer. We would ship the zipper pull and we would pay the place up front. All they would have to do was come in, put on a new pull, and they were on their way. It turned all of those broken bags into super fans. People are like, this is amazing. No company's ever treated this this well. And I was like, you know what? Maybe we can turn every opportunity that normally would be a customer service issue or a problem, we can turn it into a brand building exercise. And so that's where it really came from is no matter what, we take care of the customer. No matter what, we will take a bag back. We'll give a brand new one. We go out of our way. And that's what you it's less expensive than customer acquisition. I mean, your customer acquisition costs right now, especially in the digital world, they're very expensive. It's less expensive to keep the existing customer and it's definitely more profitable to make them happy and have them come back for more. Yeah, that's such a great entrepreneurial lesson. Of course, your background and experience in entrepreneurialism is just very vast and remarkable. And I know you've taken so much of that background and experience to Hammett and this idea where you know that when you have a customer in your hand and they have one of your handbags, you want to keep them happy because they're going to continue to wear it. They're going to continue to add to the collection. Then, of course, they're going to tell so many people. And when they're out, whether they're at the Oscars or at the Emmys or just walking to a dinner party or just going out, you know, to the, to the store and grabbing, you know, something at the market, they're carrying their handbags. Everyone comes up and they say, what kind of handbag is that? And then, of course, that good positive vibe continues to come back at Hemet, And I love that so much. Now, unfortunately for me, I know a little bit too much about handbags because my uh, wife loves handbags. Okay, and I hope she loves Hammett, Andy. Of and course. Not, and we're going to get her too. 
I love it. And uh, I'm going to make sure that we don't show her this video because I can already <laughs> see the line of ham and hambics going up our, along our, you know, the back row of our, of our bedroom. But listen, Tony, you, no, people, you, can... you picked up one of the handbags with your left hand and I looked at it and I could just see what beautiful soft leather that was. I mean, that looks just like it's the most high level leather that there is. I mean, you know, how did, how do you source all of this premium product that you're selling throughout the world right now? You know, I was really lucky early uh, in my first year. Uh, a, one of my best friends introduced me to a 25 year leather veteran, Marvin Friedman and Marvin right away sat down with me. It's like, Tony, if you're going to build this brand, you cannot do not cheap out on your leather. He goes, figure out the rest of the business, but always just make it super soft, make it last multiple lifetimes. So it can be passed down for generations. You know, if you can do that, you're going to survive even the worst of times. Well, we started in summer of 2008, the great recession. Hit. So you can imagine we did survive the worst of times and we grew every year because people that encounter our leather, it's what they say. It is the softest, it is the highest quality leather in the industry, especially when you look at, you know, this is, uh, you know, $295, $325 bag. So we're not charging two grand for that quality. So I think that that's the basis. And then you have to go further with, we have these jewelry grade hardware. So again, it's a zinc base and they're, uh, um, if it scratches or wears, we replace the hardware for free. We stand behind it, same with the zipper pulls. And even our stitching, our stitching just doesn't come out. So we have 21 points of inspection for our materials before we even use them. And then multiple points of inspection along the way while it's being manufactured. So much so, Andy, we don't have any other employees that do inspections once the product's finished. It ships directly to our retailers or directly to our customers. So we don't need to check it again. Tony, it's so powerful. And one other thing that caught our attention that is just so remarkable, and you don't see it in this day and age very often, is you offer what I call a concierge team. And in other words, you know, somebody buys from you, if they have a challenge or whatever anybody needs, you have a complete dedicated concierge team that will, that will basically have the back of your customer. So let's talk about that because that's awesome. Well, I mean, have you ever been to like... Uh old school department stores where they went to a customer service. They, oh, well, you got to go talk. Can I get a problem? I got to go customer service. It's like, well, what are you doing? And I always remember those experiences. Like, wait, you work here. Can't you help me? And so I was determined with Hammett, we would have no customer service department. We would build a concierge team like the concierge desk at the hotel. And they would take care of anything you need, whatever. You need directions. You need to go to a restaurant. You need me to call a place, get tickets. You need me to help you out. You need just to listen to you. That's a concierge team. But we take it to the next level and that the concierge team, they have the authority to do whatever it takes, just like Tony, the founder of Zappos, authorized for those, that, those team members is go out of your way to do anything to create a positive, amazing experience, and we will support you. So they make all the choices on whatever they need to do to, to, to satisfy our fans, and they really go out of their way. And they're super creative sometimes on what they do. I love it. I love it too. And for the entrepreneurs watching the show, rewind back what Tony just said. I mean, that's what I call a mini Harvard MBA right there. I mean, they're going out of their way to give their customers what they want. In other words, they've already paid for that customer acquisition cost. They're providing an amazing item. And why not just continue on with that sort of level of service and that, that approach to make sure that it's a world-class service. Now, Tony, Besides this amazing array of bags that you have out there, everybody's talking about them. They can come into your stores and see them or, you know, they can order it online. You've got the concierge service. You've got the guarantee. If there's a little something that happens, you'll fix it. No problem. I mean, you just gave me an example. Somebody brought a bag in that was 17, 18 years old and you refurbished it for him. You didn't even ask a question about it. I mean, I love that. But one thing you do is you give back to the community as well. I mean, this is a great entrepreneurial story. Again, entrepreneurs, listen to this next part. Not only do they sell this beautiful American luxury brand, 
but you're also giving back to the community as well. I mean, it's really must be in your DNA. I mean, you provide bags for nonprofit auctions. You help clean beaches up, you know, around California. I mean, this is a real way to leave a positive uh, footprint in the world. So let's talk about that because that's super cool. You know, the history starts back. We used to be these little home parties. People would invite us into their home in Manhattan Beach, California, mostly during the holidays. There would be a small charity component and people would buy our collections while sharing conversation one or 1,454 glasses of wine because we like to drink right here and uh, some cheese and some crackers. And I was sitting around. I remember it was my first year. I'm not from this. I'm like, this is so much joy over just small groups getting together and doing something for good. And we would give 15 to 25 percent of, of the revenue to the charity of choice. Well, that has grown to supporting charities across the country. We specialize in women empowerment and education. Those are the two focuses. But we'll pretty much support any positive charity you to ask nicely, as long as we have enough time with the donation of a bag. We've done special collections for them. Um, and I'm just it just really feels good. But my pivot was a couple of years ago, someone's like, Tony, there's nothing on your website. You guys don't talk about this. Why is that? And I remember I was like, well, because Cleveland boy, we just we gave, we get, you give to your church or you give to charity. That's just because it feels good. And they're like, Tony, if you could encourage other people to do this by talking about it more, then what you get is you get a double pop. You get the charitable giving that you already do, and you get to convert more people into being more charitable. So I never looked at charity as a business model. For me, this was just something you do. So, But now I sit in between it. It's not a business model. It's not just something we do. It's something we do. And it's now something we talk about. So hopefully we can inspire you if you're watching this. I promise you, don't look at it as coming back in revenue. Look at it as coming back and how good you feel about yourself and your team feels about the company. And also, just man, it's just the right thing to do, especially when you're growing and you're profitable. I mean, you don't need another toy. I can promise you, give in a little bit, we'll come way back in so many ways. Yeah, it's so great, Tony. It's so remarkable the way you've been able to just say that out loud for the entrepreneurs watching the show. You know, it's the right thing to do. And of course, you know, you mentioned Stephanie Hammett. You know, she instinctually sort of designed the first very unique clutch and then sort of the rest is history. But when we think about, you know, listening to clients, one thing that comes to mind that we've heard through the grapevine is that you listen to your clients. I mean, you're always, your team's available. If they have an idea or they want a different kind of a pocket, or maybe they have an idea to make the bags even better. You guys are all ears. And that's a, that's a real American way, if I may say so, to, to sort of approach a business. Is that yeah. something that's really resonates for you in the way in which you handle your clients? Yeah, again, it was, it, was, it was almost by accident. I mean, I started doing these things, the, the little home parties, and women would be like, can you design a bag for me? I want it to be like this or like that. Then we started doing these trunk shows, which were larger with our specialty retailers around the country. And of course, I did them all because we were small. I'd be sitting there and someone would be like, you know what? I can never find my phone. It's just this bottomless pit. And I'm, they're like, what if someone had a pocket? What if you put a cell phone pocket on the outside? And 11 years later, we're still putting one on every ham and handbag. And the same thing, it's like, you know what? These zippers are so hard to pull. I got to put my coffee down and I got to use two hands. Why can't someone make the smoothest zippers that we can just open like butter and on and on and on? And I mean, it still keeps coming. You know, you think you've, you've designed into everything and then someone's like, I carry a water bottle everywhere. I need a bag with a water bottle pocket. And I need it to be waterproof in case it spills. And you're like, I can do that. So we keep going and we keep going. And, you know, I think that also goes with our business model. Um, when I think about the best advice on the business model that I received in the fashion industry, it was all the advice I didn't listen to, Andy. It was make to margin. It was do a diffusion line. It was charge different prices to everybody. Specialties more. Department stores should get big discounts. Um, don't worry about controlling retail price because the more you sell, the better. I didn't listen to any of that. I listened to the mentors like Andrew Forbes, our CEO, CEO who comes from luxury. It's like, you have to control as best you can the relationship of price integrity, of product integrity, and then you will control brand integrity. But if you can take care of those first two, price and product, 
if you always make the most highest quality product, if you're always controlling that retail price so everybody has the same experience, at least from a pricing perspective, then your brand can take off. That's so powerful. And of course, you and Andrew, you know, you believe that corporate culture starts at the top. And, you know, the way in which you run the business is, is a magnificent way because you believe that you've got a world-class team working with you, you know? So let's talk about that because where did that come from? Where does that entrepreneurial thought come from, from you and Andrew, that you want to have the best possible team all moving in the right direction to make sure your clients get the best possible product with the best service behind it? You know, Andrew, uh, I, the, my first 10 years, we were capital constrained. We always seemed like there just wasn't enough. And so my team was overworked and underpaid. And the first thing Andrew did when he, when he became CEO, he, he laid out an organizational chart. He said, this is what we're going to build. And we will raise the capital if we need to, to do it. And we're going to get our margins up. But everyone working at the company, they need to be overpaid if they're going to be overworked. He's like, and that's where we're going. And we're going to go there fast, Tony. If you trust me, we're going to build an even stronger team. Some people will fall out. Others will join. But we want to be the best paying, most positive culture company. And then we can become the fastest growing and the most profitable. All Andrew, by the way. And I learned from it. I just got out of the way. I said, sure, I'm going to pay them. How much? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I bet they're worth it. <laughs> Yeah, remember, that's great. I'm the guy that didn't take a paycheck for like five years in the middle, right? So I was so almost like struggling financially. I didn't, I almost lost my way. And I did, I, I did lose my way. And I started to think everybody wants to work really hard and not get paid. But you know, when people work for you, they're not owners. They need to be well paid if you're going to ask them to work hard. And so I give it all to Andrew. He's a great leader. It's awesome. And it's so nice to hear you say that. You know, you, you learn so much and the way in which a powerful entrepreneur like you can sort of get out of their own way once in a while. And when you hire people <laughs> to, to come on board, you listen to them and, and you, you hire them because you trust them and you hire them because you believe in them. And what entrepreneurs do is they don't take the third step. They don't listen to them sometimes. And in your case, you did. And that's yeah. great for our younger entrepreneurs to, to hear that story as well. Tony, listen, this has been remarkable. I could, I'm could, i definitely going to have you on the show again. I know you've only cut out right. a certain amount of time for me. There's so much to explore. But before we let you go today, let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship. You know, sure. we'll have some younger entrepreneurs watching the show, you know, whether uh, they're a startup or they're moving along the process. And sometimes they hit those roadblocks. Sometimes they hit those walls that they can't get through or they freeze in the frame because they're younger. They don't really have the chops to get through it or understand what it takes to get around or through a roadblock. Maybe, Tony, you could give some of your background and experience and advice to the younger entrepreneurs watching the show on what it takes to get through those tough times and come out ahead coming out the other end. Hmm. There's a lot there to unpack, Andy. Um, before I say what it's going to take to get through the tough times, let me explain how simple it is, especially as a younger entrepreneur. Make the call. Get off the email. Get off the text. Make the call. Reach out to founders. If you're watching this, you can reach out to me. I'm a founder. Reach out to people that are going to make you successful and do not be shy and don't do it in a canned format. This is not about quantity as an entrepreneur. This is about quality. So if you figure out the five people you want to become, reach out, make the calls. And don't be shy if they don't call you back. Reach out once in a while. Stay in touch with them, even if it's one way. I promise you that consistency will get great entrepreneurs to come back and want to mentor you. And then when it comes to getting through tough times, whew, uh, yeah, you know, I used to think you could shake a tree and the money would fall off it. I had some other entrepreneurial businesses. They all worked out great financially. Uh, then when I got into this industry, I quickly found out with the Great Recession, the fact that I'd never done anything that wasn't a commodity. I've never sold luxury. I've never been in this industry. I, I was broke. And I lost my house. I got divorced. My son had to move in with his mom for the first time. And I was couch surfing. And I got to tell you, getting through tough times is really simple. Don't quit. At any point, I could have quit. Now, you should quit if you're not really a believer. You don't want to stay in it if you're, but if you believe in yourself, 
you really believe in what you're doing. You say to yourself, I know this is what's going to work. I just need more time. Double down and go deeper. Eliminate as many distractions as you can. Simplify your life like I did and push on through because those push on years will become the basis, the cornerstone, the structure that will build your brand to great heights. You're not really growing when you're having success. You're just having success. My biggest growth periods have been the biggest difficult times, the biggest struggles. And then remember that when you're on your way flying again, like we are, because tough times will come again. You're just be better equipped financially and with time to deal with them, but you never want hubris. You want to still stay humble and realize that there's others that could use your help if you're flying that high and put it out there. That's so powerful, Tony. We hear it from so many successful entrepreneurs that if you don't face those difficult challenges, you're just not pushing hard enough. And, and, and that's one of the keys that we take away from these interviews from so many high power people throughout the world, especially with entrepreneurial stories like yours. It's just remarkable. Listen, Tony, this is great. I mean, what you've done at Ham, it's remarkable. It's going to continue on. It's this three-pronged focus that you have to your customers that really makes it resonate for so many people throughout the world. I mean, they can come into your stores, they can come to the website, you've got the concierge, you've got this guarantee, you've got so many people listening to your customers. I mean, so many people are wearing the purses around the world. It's remarkable. I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, Thanks, man. we're going to bring you back. We're yes. going to talk only about your journey because it's such a fascinating journey that we want to unpack. And Tony, thank you so much for coming on the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. This has been maybe one of our most intriguing interviews. Oh, Andy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I look forward to doing this again. Thank <music> you.